So I'll tell you a little bit about my story and who I am. I'm a, a fashion photographer based in New York City. I've worked for lots of different um, magazines in, in New York. I've worked for uh, Elle and for um, uh, um, Marie Claire and for Interview and for GQ. And I got to work with some really beautiful people. I, my studio is in New York, but I also lived in Milan for about eight years and worked for, and in Paris as well and worked for the House of Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, did, I also did portraiture as well. I'll go back, skip that show, but we'll go back. Um, so we did lots of different, I worked for lots of different magazines, lots of great clients, and, but I was always told every single day who was beautiful. I was forced to work within certain parameters of the beauty standard. I was told, this is the most amazing model of the moment. You've got to photograph her. She's incredible. And you got to shift. And then the next season, it would change again. And I'd have to shift my ideas of beauty and go to the next model. And it was kind of really crazy because I saw, I'm an artist. I saw beauty everywhere. I didn't see beauty just on a magazine cover. I, I, did, a, I did a shoot with, of course, Cindy with, for Revlon and really fantastic, beautiful people. But I thought, well, you know, I'm, but someone's always telling me who's beautiful. And that was kind of frustrating. I left my studio one afternoon in New York and I was walking down Park Avenue and I saw waiting for a bus at the corner of Park and 20th, this gorgeous kid. She had long, white, beautiful hair, pale, pale skin. She had a genetic condition called albinism. I didn't know much about it, but she was stunning and I had never met a model like this before. And I went to grab her and said, I have to take your photograph, you're amazing. And the bus came, she got on and it, she took off and I was really glad because she was 12 and I'd be in prison at the moment. But it was, it was extraordinary to see this kid. So I continued right down to, to Union Square to, to the huge Barnes and Noble, started pulling any books or any information I could about this genetic condition, albinism. And I found like really kind of sad images. I didn't find images of this kid. I found images of people sitting in hospital beds looking sad, looking downtrodden, looking just images of despair. I found images of a bright red eye, the albino eye. I'm thinking, this kid had beautiful blue eyes. She didn't have red eyes. And then I started seeing images from Africa where kids were surrounded by tribes pointing spears at them or in, in cancer wards and clinics where they're just in beds and images of illness, of sadness, of sickness. And then I started, of course, going through those same medical textbooks and started finding these typical images of kids and adults in their underwear against walls and doctor's offices with the black bar across their eyes saying, disease. This is a disease defined by a disease. And then, I was like, this is crazy. And then I started going into f further, looking at the internet and all these different medical textbooks and everything was so sad and so negative. I then started finding images of the albino freak family in the circus and then, of course, all the movie references from Powder, who, who had albinism because his mother was struck by lightning, lightning to the princess bride and to the, like the Matrix Reloaded. There were the ghost-like twins that came in and wreaked havoc and, and destroyed things and then disappeared. Even most recently, the Da Vinci Code, where it was like the evil albino driving around Paris at night, killing people, shooting at people. Well, I found out through my research that people with albinism have a visual impairment. There's always vision, but they're considered legally blind. So they certainly wouldn't be driving around Paris and like shooting at anybody and expect to hit anything. So I'm thinking, this is crazy. So I contact NOAA. Now NOAA is the National Organization for Albinism and Hypopigmentation. It's a support group for people living with this condition and their families. And I'm like, hey, I'm a fashion photographer. Let's show the world the beauty of albinism. And they said, get lost. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty persistent. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they said, they made it very really clear to me about their fears of exploitation. That every time there was a magazine article that came out about a kid with albinism, it was a story about a victim. It was sad or was exploitative or sensational, never positive, always negative. And I said, okay, well then what, can we, what do we do here? I said, so let's form a non-traditional partnership, fashion photographer, genetic support group, and we'll work together and you can keep an eye on me to make sure that we create something positive and powerful, showing the world the beauty of albinism. And they said, okay, and I was like, fantastic, let's do this. So in walks the first person I'm about to photograph. Her name is Christine, and Christine is a knockout. Long white hair, really tall, she's stunning. She walks into my studio, the only way that she walks in though, instead of this gorgeous girl, she walks in like this. Her head's down, shoulders hunched, one word answers, she looks with no eye contact. This kid has been teased her whole life because of her difference. And it was so apparent on the fact that it left her with zero, zero self-esteem. I'm thinking, oh, this kid is so 
she's just so so fragile. And just the day before, I was shooting Cindy in the same on the same set in my studio. I'm thinking, well, I have to be I have to be so careful. I thought, no, out of respect for this gorgeous kid, I'm going to photograph her like I would anybody else. So the fan went on, the music went on, and I grabbed a mirror that was next to the set and I held it up to her and I said, Christina, look at yourself. You're magnificent. And she looked in the mirror and she got it. And she went from this to that. And that's our Christina. She just exploded in front of the set. Well, she was all, well, by the time she left the studio, she was kissing everybody on both cheeks and saying, ciao. And she was unbelievable. And I saw this transformation right in front of the lens through photography that she was now transformed with a powerful and positive sense of who she is. The next day she goes to school, she's going to change the way her community sees her difference. Instead of walking into that classroom like this, she's walking in like this. So it's all about embarrassment ambassadors for change. It was extraordinary. And those first images, right after we, we did a series of images on several individuals with this syndrome, uh, had this, uh, this condition, uh, was in life, they were in Life magazine in 1998, so it was a while ago. It was a cover story, it was a five-page spread, it was really a fantastic pro, um, editorial, it was great, I loved it. Then we used the, a lot of the images, though, from Life, <laughs> to put them in make, uh, other magazines, magazines worldwide, magazines in the UK, in France, in Italy, Canada, there were, and other magazines in the States. It was amazing. Um, so it's from the UK, it's Christina again, friends, Jen and Ruthie are sisters, and Kristen. That's uh, Lauren, we did a, 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 a campaign for sunglasses. A lot of kids with this condition have, are photophobic, so they have a real strong light sensitivity. So we thought, perfect for an eyeglass campaign, a sunglass campaign. Uh, uh, people Magazine did a great story. So it was, real, it was circulating things where people were saying all this great stuff. It was fantastic. So I was getting calls, though, getting calls from the UK saying, well, we just saw this spread. Can you come and photograph our kids with this condition? Can you come? We have a support group here. Can you come and meet our families? People in Africa were doing calling the same. New Zealand, can you help us start a support group? I'm like, fantastic. This is great. Let's do it. Um, so I would travel all these places. And as I was shooting and doing my commercial work, I was at a local chapter conference in Philadelphia, small family conference, about 40 families, did my presentation of kids with albinism. This my mom came up, come, came up to me and she said, you know, my son Randy, when he was a little boy, he'd come home from school and I could see the kids were teasing him and he'd be in tears. And I'd buy him an ice cream cone or, or a toy truck or, and he'd forget about it. She said, now he's in high school, he comes home from school, I could see the pain, the anguish in his eyes. He walks in, he comes, goes, walks in, walks right past me, goes up to his room, slams the door, and I don't see him until the next day. She said, he's not going to want to be photographed, he has zero self-esteem, this kid is such poor body image, and he's just, it's so, it's, he's just so shy. But if you could just show him photographs of kids his own age, so that he knows he's not alone. I'm like, of course, where is he? Show me. She points over to Randy. Now, Randy's standing there. His pants are hanging down to here. His underwear is hanging out. He has this long, great big shirt. He has 10 earrings. He has a tattoo. He's amazing, this kid. I crawl over to Randy. I'm like, Randy, I speak to moms and dads every single day, terrified about the future of their kids with albinism. All they have to do is take one look at you, and they're going to be fun. Please let me take your photo. Your mother said, and she told me that you didn't want to be photo. He's like, wait, he said, Rick, what do you mean? I get? He said, Rick, you have to understand, I'm 16 years old. I don't talk to my mother. And then he, <laughs> you could say, and then he said, I want to be photographed. I want to show the world about who I am with my albinism, but also other things about him. You can see how shy he was. Very, very shy, Randy. But Randy created early days in this idea of this nonprofit group, Positive Exposure, the idea of networking stories, sharing experiences, and the images around the world. Uh, I'll kind of quickly go through uh, Albin. So I started, I was very interested at that point getting calls from everybody in the world to find out more about this idea, a message about albinism or, or perceptions of people in communities about the syndrome albinism. So I started hearing about stigmas and discrimination. And I actually, so what I looked at is really trying to explore cultural perceptions and attitudes towards this condition. This is my friend Gladys Mira, who's a Kuna Indian in the San Blas region of the world, um, and, and the San Blas region of, of, of uh, Panama. She's extraordinary. So the incidence of albinism is about 1 in 20,000 worldwide. In the Kuna Indian, it's 1 in 125, the highest incidence in the world. Uh, we went to Fiji, actually, where we found out at the turn of the 19th century, a tribe could not hold their territory. Let's say it's somebody with albinism in a powerful political position. 
uh, and, and Keke, my fr great friend Keke, I photographed in New Zealand. She's from New, from India, from New De from Delhi. But she, her family left Delhi because she was getting death threats. Now I'm thinking this is horrible. They had to move because she's eight years old. And we actually started a support group in Delhi and found out that there are many kids that we worked with in their communities after we started this group in India that have had really positive experiences. So one of the things that we're making sure we want to make very clear is that we're not making generalizations about a community or a culture and their reaction to people that are different. Uh, Keke's experiences were very different, but we met many kids there that have been embraced by their communities throughout India. A uh, great friend, uh, uh, Suwana from Korea. Tom, who was just adopted by an American family from China. It's my great friend, Harry, from Puerto Rico. Uh, Natalia, she and I started the first albinism society in Russia. Uh, Maizan and her sister and, and mom in Malaysia. Kiara, Kiara, all she ever wanted to do was be a dancer. She was told that because of her visual impairment, she'll never dance. She'll never be able to follow the choreography or the dance steps, never. She's like, oh, but to me, she's like, they said, find another love, another passion. She's like, no, she's New Zealand's Celtic dance champion and just started a school for dance for kids with visual impairment. My grandma going to zip through this, Roz from Australia. I a lot, spent a lot of time in Africa where there's a high incidence of mortality associated with albinism due to skin cancer. Uh, so my friend Siri, who when she was born, the, mother, the father's family put her out of the house thinking she was cursed. Put her out of the house and, and mom, not knowing what to do, put Siri in the sun to get her dark like her brothers and sisters. So you can say it's all sun damage. Uh, this is a great friend. A lot of kids that I met throughout Africa were put in schools, special schools, uh, schools for the blind, not because of the tools were better there for kids with visual impairment, but more importantly, because the teasing was so great, the discrimination is so great, these kids don't do well in mainstream schools. I started an albinism society in Kenya with my friend CK, who actually went to a mainstream school. I'm like, CK, how is it possible you went to a mainstream school? Nobody in Africa goes to mainstream schools. She said, it's because of my twin sister, Daphne. I'm like, fantastic. She said, yeah, Daphne would get all the work off the board, the things I couldn't see. She'd help me with it. When the, the type was too small, she'd blow it up for me. She said, but more importantly, when kids would tease me, Daphne would beat them up. <laughs> But on a sadder note, though, I'm spending a lot of time in Tanzania where witch doctors are saying, bring me the bones of an albino and I'll make a potion that will make you rich. So we're working very closely with the, the government there. They've been there six times in the last two years to really kind of create programs, public awareness programs, to save these kids. I'll kind of go quickly through these. I received the, uh, so dancer, this is in the Shinyanga reason. These are one of the visuals that we created in, um, in Africa, in East Africa, trying to fight and, and kind of educate the public. Um, this is actually, I received the Art of Reporting Award from the, an organization called the Chromosome 18 Registry. Um, and it was actually the more larger organization, sorry, was the Genetic Alliance, which was a coalition of all the genetic support groups, and it was the, the award for the Life magazine piece. The president at the time said, I'm also the founder and director of this Chromosome 18 Research Society and Registry. I'm like, fantastic, that's great, what's that mean? She's like, well, if you have a, a, an anomal anomaly on your 18th chromosome, then you have all kinds of problems and difficulties and challenges, and, and then we'd look after you as this, through the support group like Noah is. So I'm like, it's great. She's like, well, she said, I see there's a universal message here about all kids with differences, so it's not just about albinism. Would you come and speak to our families in San Antonio with these chromosome 18 anomalies? I'm like, sure. I went back to thinking, what the hell is a chromosome 18 anomaly? I was an art major at the School of Visual Arts. I had no idea. When I looked it up, I looked in all, these are the images that I saw. I'm thinking, Ay, albinism was so easy, this is going to be rough. But I went, San Antonio, walked down to the auditorium where the kids and young adults were, opened the door, and it was instantly surrounded by kids screaming with laughter. They were kids with, with cleft palates, kids with mobility issues, feeding tubes, trachs, but they were kids first and foremost. That's Rebecca and Pauline. My great friend, that's Ellington. He's awesome. Remy. It's Emery. Byron. Taylor. Elizabeth. It's just some of my great friend Sean. These are, um, so we decided at that point to involve other organizations to be part of this larger exhibition that was going to be uh, uh, sent out at the, the um, uh, from the People's Genome Celebration in 2001. They invited me to the National Human Genome Research Institute and the Genetic Alliance invited me to create an exhibition at the Smithsonian commemorating the mapping of the human genome. So we actually invited other genetic support groups to be part of this exhibition, not just on albinism, but all groups, again, illustrating the universal applicability. I saw these images from the Marfan Foundation. These kids grow very, very tall at risk of an aortic dissection, but they're amazing kids. And I thought, how gorgeous. I understood the importance of 
of this image. How important it was to show how beautiful, I mean, to show how the image presents itself. But isn't there another way to show up? Because nobody, and I photograph thousands of kids now with Marfan syndrome, and nobody stands like this with a portable black bar. It's just, it's extraordinary. So we decided to put him in a pool, show Billy swimming, show how, you know, how it presents itself, but keep going and keep presenting how, how these kids look. And, and, but putting the humanity back in these gorgeous images. Well, I only have a few minutes, seconds here, so I'm gonna kind of go through. Cool girls at the Costello Conference. These are great friends of Danielle and Maggie who actually met at the last Costello conference. They both, first time they ever met anybody with the same syndrome, but, and they, they go to the same conferences every year, and I go and photograph them. And this year they were there again in Florida, but this time it's a little different. They have, um, they're gangsters now, but they're <laughs> pretty amazing kids. I just want to quickly go and talk, talk very briefly about this really great kid. He's just, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was going to go on it's so all. But I just want to talk very briefly about a project that we're taking these images and bringing them into high schools. Making, well, I can photograph a great kid in my studio and she's having a brilliant time and she feels up 10,000 feet tall. By the time she leaves my studio and gets to Park Avenue, the, 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 some five people point at her, point at her birthmark, or her white hair, or her wheelchair. So we have to make it relevant for all of us, for all these kids, to make people understand and understand what the idea of celebrating diversity actually means. So we started a project called the Pearls Project where these kids are photographs are going into high schools and the kids that are in the images are blogging and the students are following their blogs. And they all have these great video intros. I'm just going to give you this last one. And this is actually Byron, who is actually one of our bloggers. Hi, my name is Byron. I live in the D.C. area. I'm 14. When I was 10 months old, I had a left hemispherectomy. Um, I had the left half of my brain removed because I have a... I have something called Sturge Weber syndrome. I wear a brace on the on my right leg and right arm. I only see out of the right side of each eye. So sometimes it's harder for me to see some see things on the right side. So playing sports can be frustrating because I might not see a ball coming. Um Um, I didn't see that coming either. So these are the image, these are the, so we're using all the, the visual arts to change public perceptions through these great kids. I feel as an artist, it's my responsibility to, I know that when I was a kid and I saw someone with, that was different walking down the street, I, if I stared, I got slapped by my mom. So the idea was either, if you, if you don't, don't stare, look away. And I think as an artist, it's my responsibility and all of our responsibilities to steady that gaze a little bit longer, longer to really see, because you stand there, you'll see difference, you'll, you'll start seeing beauty in that difference, and you'll start seeing beautiful gorgeousness and then this light just spreads and once you're enlightened it just it changes your whole world it's about seeing the beauty in all differences thank you so much i'm sorry i ran over thank you guys thank you